America, from the ground up, is made possible in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Central Michigan University College of Humanities, Social, and Behavioral Sciences. The Kirby Foundation, a family foundation supporting education. And B.K. Bradshaw, author of the Crystal Brave series of young adult novels encouraging young people to explore archaeology. For most of us, the British burning of the White House is the iconic symbol of the War of 1812. But the continuing struggle for American independence from Britain wasn't just being fought in the original 13 colonies. It was a frontier war fought for control of the inland water highways of North America. Out here on the frontier, in massive naval battles on the lakes and rivers, in fierce battles at places like Prophetstown, and in forts and settlements across the West, the War of 1812 was a wilderness war. When most of us think about naval engagements in the War of 1812 or the Revolutionary War, we might imagine the massive battles that are taking place for places like New York and Boston. But the reality is, out here on the Great Lakes, the battles are just as fierce as those being fought on the high seas. It's a war in which the British and their native allies and the Americans and their native allies fought for the control of a continent. It's America's second war for independence. The end of the American Revolution in 1783 did not mark the end of hostilities between Americans and the British. In fact, renewed hostilities between the British and America's main ally, France, threatened to drag America into another world war. Furthermore, the British policy of encouraging Native American resistance in the interior Northwest threatened to undermine American hopes to control the Great Lakes region. For several decades, European and American settlers had been encroaching on Indian lands in the Ohio River Valley. And despite the outcome of the revolution, native groups still hoped to create an Indian-only territory as a buttress against those settlers. At the same time, some native leaders began to call for a pan-Indian alliance to resist white settlement in their territory. Prophetstown is located along the Wabash River in Indiana, and it's at the heart of the pan-Indian alliance started by Tecumseh and his brother the Prophet. The Pan-Indian movement started by the two brothers garnered support between 1809 and 1811 by preaching cultural dignity, land retention, and opposition to white settlement on the frontier. So Tecumseh does use that as a rallying point, saying if you don't fight them, they will fight you. The fight's coming. It's inevitable. So what side are you on? And a lot of leaders started to hear this and adhere to what Tecumseh was saying. As Tecumseh said in his speech to the Osage Indians in 1811, quote, brothers, the white men are not friends to the Indians. At first, they only asked for land sufficient for a wigwam. Now, nothing will satisfy them but the whole of our hunting grounds, from the rising to the setting sun. A lot of people bypass the whole Indian aspect of 1812. That, you know, they see that the British and the Americans are fighting, but the Indians were fighting the Americans before 1812. Out here in the Old Northwest Territory, the War of 1812 actually starts in 1811 here at Prophetstown. In fact, Tecumseh and his alliance were seen by the Americans as perhaps the primary threat to expansion into the territory. So territorial governor William Henry Harrison assembled an army of over a thousand men and advanced on Tippecanoe. Meanwhile, Tecumseh was away recruiting warriors to join him, but early in the morning of November 11th, the Indians attacked Harrison's army. The ensuing battle saw the Americans ward off the attack and burn Prophetstown. While Harrison's later presidential ambitions saw him paint the victory as decisive, his attack served to push Tecumseh and his allies closer to the British and represented the opening salvo in the war. While the Americans depict Tippecanoe as the defeat of Tecumseh's confederation, there's no denying he was one of the most capable field generals in North America, 
who would become a national hero for his alliance with the British, becoming something of a founding father of a Canadian national identity. I was talking to one of the park rangers here at Prophetstown today, and she was telling me that one of the questions visitors ask most often is why would you build a park around three years of human history? And I think that question misses the point of Prophetstown, really. It's not like Tecumseh and his brother turned up in a field and said, hey, great place for a village. You know, this place is a culturally significant landscape that had been important to Native Americans for a thousand years or more. Off to my left here on the bluff, there are at least a dozen burial mounds. So this place had significance and importance and a history beyond just that one event. Following the Louisiana Purchase in 1802, in which President Jefferson bought the territory from France, establishing control of America's frontier territory became a strategic imperative for the young nation. Further complicating matters, the American War for Independence had left a number of issues between Britain and her former colony unresolved. Among these were the northwest boundaries of the United States and commercial access to British markets by American merchants. Prior to the Revolution, Britain was America's primary trade partner, and in the war's aftermath, commercial relations between the two remained complicated. It's sort of like an angry, messy divorce where the unhappy former couple still own the same business. Despite commercial contacts, the hostility between the Americans, particularly on the frontier, and the British intensified. But in the East, where the ties of commerce were strongest, there was little appetite for another war with Britain. However, the combination of British encouragement of Indian raiding and resentment at British impressment of American sailors led the Americans to send John Jay as an emissary. The Treaty Jay negotiated was a victory of sorts for the pro-British faction of the new American government, but it failed to settle key concerns. And conflict erupted out here in Michigan, where control of the water highways of the Great Lakes meant access to the whole of the Northwest. You might remember Michigan's first territorial governor, William Hull, as a Revolutionary War general. But it's probably not too unkind to suggest that he was more of an accidental tourist of history than anything. In fact, he spent most of his tenure here in Michigan finding ways to enrich himself rather than prepare the place for statehood or attend to his duties as the governor. So naturally, Hull would be your first choice to lead the American invasion of Canada. In early July of 1812, he mustered up his poorly trained militia and sailed across the river into Canada. Only problem, he forgot to bring his artillery. Over there in Windsor, Hull dithered for most of July, building carriages for the artillery that he hadn't bothered to bring along on the invasion to start with. Hull's invasion plans were dealt a further blow when it was discovered that Mackinac had been taken by the British. On St. Joseph Island, just across the Canadian line, the British built a fort to counter the American presence at Mackinac. Unlike the dithering Hull, the British commander, Captain Charles Roberts, was quick to act after hearing that war had been declared. Roberts' troops landed on the north side of the island, and they quickly moved into position to assault the lightly garrisoned American fort. The Americans surrendered after being surprised by one shot. The victory at Mackinac effectively gave the British control of the Great Lakes and much of the Northwest Territory. However, it's important to remember that native troops made up the bulk of British forces, and this was often the case, particularly on the American frontier and in Upper Canada. So the vast majority of the fighting force for the British on this occasion were native warriors. And this has been you know, a reoccurrence throughout the Great Lakes of native warriors participating in great numbers, hundreds of warriors uh, aligning themselves with the French and then later on with the British against the Americans in the War of 1812. So this was no anomaly. This is something that occurred over and over and over where these warriors would band together in large numbers and, uh, and fight. After capturing Fort Mackinac, the British executed a cunning plan. What they did is they left the American flag flying over the fort and let all of the cargo ships that wanted to come into port. As soon as they're in port, they were seized by the British, outfitted with guns, and sent out into battle. The British got themselves a free, ready-made navy. Fearing that the loss of Mackinac left his entire position vulnerable, Hull retreated to Detroit. And in mid-August, when British General Isaac Brock launched an invasion, Hull surrendered without a fight. From the outset of his doomed invasion of Canada, Hull had been at loggerheads with his officers and leaders of the militia. In addition, he feared his under-equipped troops were no match for the combined British and Indian forces led by Brock and Tecumseh. It's in the context of this pan-Indian war that Hull's surrender at Detroit has to be understood. 
frontier violence from 1770s until 1800 is just, it's barbaric. And it's, it goes both ways. I mean, some of these atrocities down in Ohio and Indiana, they, they fall through the cracks of history. And a lot of these warriors are remembering this as they go into 1812. Because you, you hear about the, the massacre at Fort Dearborn, the massacre at River Raisin, where these Indian warriors, you know, ex extracted vengeance on civilians, basically, and prisoners. And that's always played out through history, the massacres, the massacres. But native populations have a different aspect of that. A lot of them call them revenge killings, that this happened to my village, and I'm going to pay this on to your village. I've probably been somewhat unkind to William Hull. It probably is the case that he surrendered Detroit because he feared that he had insufficient troops to defend the place. And I'm sure that the memory of Prophetstown and the threat of Tecumseh's forces had something to do with that surrender. That opinion wasn't shared by the court-martial that sentenced Hall to death. It was only a presidential pardon by James Madison that saved him from being shot. The losses at Detroit and Mackinac had cost the Americans control of the Great Lakes. But while victory on land might have been hard to come by, on the water, it was a different story. One of the largest naval battles in the War of 1812 did not take place on the high seas of the Atlantic. Instead, it was fought right here in the interior of the American continent along the shores of Lake Erie. On the morning of September 10, 1813, an American naval force under the command of Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry collided with a British squadron just off the Bass Islands in the western half of Lake Erie. The boat that we're traveling on today started its life as the Friends Goodwill, a merchant vessel. After it was seized, it was renamed the HMS Little Bell. The Friends Goodwill was one of the first ships taken by the British at Mackinac. As the Little Belt, it was part of the British fleet that would prove no match for Perry's force. During a devastating battle that raged for over three hours, the Americans and the British traded broadsides and raking fire. Perry's flagship, the Lawrence, was reduced to a ruined hulk with most of its crew dead or wounded. But amazingly, Perry made it unharmed to his sister ship, the Niagara, and continued the fight. In no condition to continue, the British commander, Robert Barclay, struck his colors and surrendered in the mid-afternoon. In September of 1813, out here on Lake Erie, Perry's victory over the British at the Battle of Lake Erie allowed the Americans to reassert supremacy over the Great Lakes. It also set the stage for the Americans to retake Michigan. And a month later, in October, Tecumseh was finally defeated at the Battle of Thames. With the defeat of British naval power on the inland waterways and the disruption of native supply lines, the stage was set for two key American victories. While Hull was busy botching the invasion in the Western Theater at Detroit, plans were being made to invade our friendly, polite neighbors to control the St. Lawrence River. Between 1808 and 1812, the British built a series of these massive defensive towers on the bluffs here overlooking the river. They did so because they were afraid of another American attack like the one that was launched during the Revolution. If there was an American war plan, and let's face it, historians are still arguing over what that could have been, it was most likely to seize control of Canada from Quebec to the Great Lakes, thereby establishing effective control over all of the water systems from the St. Lawrence River to the Gulf of Mexico. The St. Lawrence River and the Lake Champlain region were vital strategically. If the British controlled those water highways, they had unfettered access into the heart of America all the way to New York via the Hudson River. For the Americans, control of Quebec and Montreal would effectively choke off British supply lines into the interior. The Americans devised a two-pronged attack, 
with one group setting out from Lake Ontario and the other traveling up Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River. Which from 1813 to 1814 makes the area between Upper and Lower Canada a key focus of the war. Sackett's Harbor on Lake Ontario became the center of American naval activity for the Great Lakes and an important shipbuilding facility. The American advance from Lake Ontario ended in defeat at Chrysler Farm on the St. Lawrence River, where the British beat back an American attack despite being outnumbered more than two to one. Meanwhile, in the Lake Champlain region, the planned American invasion was beaten back by British, Canadian, and Mohawk forces. By June of 1813, the British held effective control of the Richelieu River and most of Lake Champlain. Their raids on American settlements in the region along the lake disrupted American supply lines and seriously hindered the war effort. Regaining naval superiority on the lake was now imperative. As the tide of the war tipped to the British, the burning of Washington, D.C. in August of 1814 meant that the Americans were desperately in need of a victory. And that victory would come out here on Lake Champlain. Archaeologist Adam Kane has spent most of his career researching the shipwrecks of Lake Champlain. I asked him to tell me about the battle. The War of 1812 on Lake Champlain is defined by one large naval battle, the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, September 11, 1814. How many ships are going to be involved in oh, it? Oh, there is, each fleet had um, eight to ten large warships and then a contingent of uh, smaller uh, gunboats and bateau with them. How many guns on the gunboats? Uh, the gunboats, usually between one and three guns. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the largest British ship, the Confiance, was a 32 gun vessel. So the that's largest. A massive. Ocean oh, massive. Vessel. Yeah, the, the largest warship to ever be on Lake Champlain. Uh, and was, uh, you know, it was a, a, a big part of the battle. And that was, um, played a significant role right in the middle of the, the British lines. The British plan was to invade up the Richelieu with an overwhelming force of 11,000, supported by naval fire from a flotilla led by the Confiance. The American shipyard was located at Otter Creek near Crown Point. In 1814, Lieutenant Thomas McDonough completed construction of his vessels. McDonough's fleet was hastily assembled. Indeed, the Ticonderoga was initially designed as a commercial steam vessel, but this was unreliable, and it was finished out as a more reliable sailing ship and outfitted for the war effort. In the run-up to the battle, most of the American army had left for Sackett's Harbor, and Brigadier General Alexander Macomb was left with a force of 1,500. This was augmented by 2,000 untrained, poorly equipped militia. The British attack was led by Lieutenant General Sir George Prevost, Commander-in-Chief of all British forces in North America. The British held a massive advantage over the Americans in both the number and the experience of the troops. The British fleet was under the command of Captain George Downey, and led by the 36-gun frigate HMS Confiance, the largest warship ever to sail on Lake Champlain. Outgunned by the British, the Americans anchored in Plattsburgh Bay so as to force a fight at close range. The American tactics were simple but effective. McDonough had arranged it so that he could quickly spin his ships by anchoring at both ends and spinning one end loose to pivot and then fire both sides before the British could respond. On the day, McDonough's tactics were superior, and the Americans handily defeated the British. Downey was killed, and the mighty Confiance taken. A humiliated Prevost was relieved of his command and ordered to return to London. Divers and archaeologists from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum have spent decades mapping and recording the shipwrecks there. I asked Adam to tell me about the finds from the battle site. We have some artifacts here from the debris field from the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, am I correct? Yeah, some great pieces. These were recovered 20, 30 years ago during uh, an, an archaeological project in which the debris field was located in the, on the bottom of Plattsburgh Bay. This, is the, this debris field was after the Americans had won the battle, the two fleets were combined, and the decks were cleared. Right. That's the phrase, clearing the decks. Clearing the decks. Everything that was broken was just thrown into the lake. It was swept off the decks, thrown into the lake. So we have pieces that reflect that. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most amazing telling pieces 
from the battle. This is a piece of copper. It's a copper patch that would have gone onto a boat to cover uh, a leak in the hull right. uh, to stop it from leaking. And it looks like it had an even worse leak later a on. A much worse leak. You can see it has had a cannonball go right into it. Uh, you can see stamped all over this are British broad arrows. So this was from uh, a British vessel. So Adam, what kind of ordnance was being used here on Le Champlain during the War of 1812? Well, Monty, one of the things that we see is people are extraordinarily clever in figuring out ways to try and kill them, kill each other. Uh, so we have a whole series of ordnance uh, found on the bottom of Lake Champlain from the War of 1812, uh, and they range from anti-personnel uh, ordnance uh, to uh, ordnance designed to sink ships. So we've got examples here of a 19th century arms race. Exactly, that's exactly right. Uh, so in the anti-personnel realm, we have, uh, yep, these are grape shot, and this is the cannon equivalent of a shotgun. So it is, uh, you have uh, hundreds- Large blast cones. Exactly, hundreds of these balls wrapped up in a, in a canvas bag with a wooden sabot at the bottom fired out of a cannon in a large blast range, and so you would have dozens of these wrapped around uh, a, a case, uh, wrapped up in a case and, and shot out of a cannon, and as they shoot out, they, that's, there's that same blast range. And right here in front of me, we've got probably the most terrifying weapon I've seen. It, it is the most terrifying, uh, and I would have to think that for the sailors on board, it would be the most terrifying, and although you might look at this and think, well, they're trying to sink ships with this, they're not. This is anti, an anti-personnel. It's not a solid cannonball. It is not solid. It's a mortar, and those are those were real life. Uh, it's meant ordnance. to explode and scatter exactly. metal across a large it is, area. Sends it uh, has a high arc when they're shot, and then explodes, sending shrapnel down. Right. So it's not the supposed ship. to hit the ship. It's supposed to explode no. over top of it, exactly. and then rain down exactly. fragments of steel. Throughout the series, the sites we've visited from labs to museums to archaeological digs have seen scientists racing against time to preserve our national heritage. Proper care and conservation of sites and artifacts is necessary if we hope to preserve our historic treasures. Unfortunately, we don't always treat our historic treasures with the dignity they deserve. Despite her heroic role at the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, the Ticonderoga is yet again under threat. This time, the enemy is insufficient funding. And despite the best efforts of the community, there is no money available for the conservation. The American victory on Lake Champlain robbed the British of a strategic bargaining chip and set the stage for the Americans to deny British claims to more territory. In the Northwest, General William Henry Harrison's defeat of the British and native forces at the Battle of Thames in October of 1813 broke Tecumseh's Indian Confederacy and set the modern borders of Canada and the United States in the region. Meanwhile, in the strategically important Niagara region, the Americans and British traded victories, with the Americans capturing Fort George in May and the British capturing Fort Niagara later that same year. In the South, General Andrew Jackson's reputation was made with a hollow victory over the British at New Orleans in January of 1815. The battle was fought after peace was agreed, but word hadn't yet come to the far reaches of the frontier. The War of 1812 is a formative event in North American history. Out of it, a Canadian national identity is formed, U.S. control of territory east of the Mississippi is consolidated, and native resistance to settlement in the east is broken. Out of the wars of the 18th and 19th centuries, the U.S. and Canada forged national identities, and the continent's native peoples were pushed further and further into the margins of the North American continent, and some into extinction. While as president, Andrew Jackson might speak of extending the area of freedom, in effect, what he and many Americans sought was nothing less than ethnic cleansing. This was accomplished in the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which saw 46,000 Native American men, women, and children forced from their land. The irony of Jackson's extension of freedom is that it opened 25 million acres of land to white settlers and the institution of slavery. Historical documents tell us what our ancestors thought we should know but archaeology can show us what they actually did. I believe it's one of the tools that we can use to peel away the layers of time and celebrate the achievements and failures, the triumphs and tragedies that tell the real story of America from the ground up.
check out the America from the Ground Up website for crew blogs, behind-the-scenes photographs, and more. America, from the ground up, is made possible in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Central Michigan University College of Humanities, Social, and Behavioral Sciences. The Kirby Foundation, a family foundation supporting education. And B.K. Bradshaw, author of the Crystal Brave series of young adult novels encouraging young people to explore archaeology.